So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 FDA Circe Lecture Series. My name is Lawrence Lynn, and I'm the Executive Director of the UCSF Stanford Circe. And it's my pleasure today to introduce Esteban Bouchard, who's going to be today's speaker. Esteban Bouchard is a professor in the Schools of Medicine and Pharmacy at the University of California, San Francisco. He directs a large interdisciplinary research program focusing on minority children, gene environment interactions for asthma, population genetics, and precision medicine in racially diverse populations. Dr. Bouchard's team was the first in the world to correlate genetic ancestry to lung function in Latino and African American populations. Dr. Burchard received his MPH from UC Berkeley and his medical degree from Stanford University. He completed his internal medicine residency at Harvard's Brigham and Women's Hospital and his fellowship training at UCSF in pulmonary and critical care medicine. Dr. Burchard previously served as an advisor on President Obama's Precision Medicine Initiative and has received awards from the American Thoracic Society, the National Medical Association and San Francisco State University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Burchard. And uh, everyone, I'm actually traveling. I'm calling you from Puerto Rico. Um, we're doing a, we have a few clinical recruitment site here, so I'm here. Uh, good afternoon. And today I'm going to discuss race, genetic ancestry, and medicine, uh, uh, reflecting on a paper that we published January 6th of uh, 2021. Um, in the New England Journal of Medicine, you might have missed it because of the insurrection. Um, again, my name is Dr. Esteban Gonzalez Bouchard, and I'm the director of the UCSF Asthma Collaboratory. Today, I'm going to discuss three topics. One is race, ethnicity. What does it mean? What is the big debate? Then I'm going to get, present some recent data that was funded by the FDA and Genentech. And then I'm going to discuss one of our seminal uh, findings uh, about genetic ancestry and clinical algorithms for lung disease. But before I begin, I, I will just uh, say that I uh, provide this disclaimer. I actually have no conflicts of interest and nothing to disclose. The views and opinions presented here represent those of me, my opinions, and they should not be considered to represent uh, advice or guidance on behalf of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. So the big debate is, um, should we use race and ethnicity in clinical and biomedical research? And the field and the discussion has been divided into whether or not race is purely a social construct or purely a biologic construct. And why some people disagree, uh, people consider race ethnicity and say that it's a purely social construct with strong ties to racism, leading to bias in clinical algorithms and thus perpetuating racism, that race and ethnicity are imprecise when used as a proxy for ancestry. Honestly, the same goes for social determinants and also leads to misclassification of disease. Perhaps derivation populations were not truly quote unquote healthy and instead their measures represent indolent effects of social determinants of health. And as I mentioned, we'll, today we'll discuss, uh, I'll argue for the inclusion of modern genetic advances in, in clinical assessments of lung health and disease. I'm a pulmonary board certified physician expert in lung disease. Um, I'll demonstrate that genetic ancestry is associated with lung function, even after controlling for the social determinants of health. And I'll discuss how ignoring racial and ethnic differences in health and disease and drug re response can do more harm than good. Well, this discussion has percolated up as a result of the murder of George Floyd. However, almost 20 years ago, in fact, precisely 20 years ago, we published a paper on this um, after the completion of the Human Genome Project or the initial sequencing uh, in 
2000. And you may recall that uh, President Clinton, uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair, and Francis Collins got on a stage and said, the human genome shows that there's no value and no evidence that there are genetic differences in racial groups. And so we should all hold hands and be kumbaya. Well, I was trained as a physician, scientist, a geneticist, a genetic epidemiologist, and I studied race and genetics for lung function. So we took issue with this and we published this editorial, this perspective, as part of a debate, a pro-con debate in the New England Journal in March 20 of 2003. So we submitted it in 2002, so 20 years ago, calling out the importance of race and ethnic background in biomedical and clinical research. We argue strongly uh, that there were significant genetic differences that, uh, that were clinically significant uh, and that we needed to pay, we as a society and medical community and biomedical community needed to pay attention to it. 11 years ago, we followed up on our previous work and asked the question, given that there's this genetic revolution out there, how many people have benefited from modern genetic studies? And we published this paper in Nature in 2011, so 11 years ago. And we demonstrated pretty clearly that out of all modern genetic studies done here from the completion of the Human Genome Project up to 2010, that 96% were done in populations of European descent. Even though Europeans represent 12% of the world population, they represent over 96% of modern genetic studies. That means that less than 4% of the world population or non-European populations benefit from modern advances. We thought that would shake up the world, but it really didn't because Alicia Martin followed up on our work and published this paper in uh, 2019 and basically demonstrating the proportion of populations that were included in modern genetic studies at the time. And it's pretty simple. The top graph demonstrates the proportion. Red is populations of European origin. All the other color colors are an amalgamation of all the non-European populations. And you can see going back to 2006 on the far left up to 2018, that the majority of populations increased in Europe that were of European origin, even though they make up less than 12% of the world populations. When we look at the uh, US population, which funds the National Institutes of Health, which funds the majority of modern genetic studies, African-Americans and Latinos make up less than 2% and 0.5% of modern genetic studies, despite the fact that we, and I'm Latino, make up over 36% of the US population or we also make up 36% of the taxpayers that fund the federal government to do this sort of research. Well, like many of you, my colleagues and I were disturbed by the killing of George Floyd, Trayvon Martin, Breonna Taylor, many others. And because of those events, it brought up the issue of race and genetic ancestry and medicine again. Um, and we used empiric data and published this paper here on January 6, 2021. Again, it was a day of the insurrection, so you probably missed it. The New York Times probably skipped over it. The Wall Street Journal skipped over it. But here we used empiric data, not opinions, empiric data to demonstrate that there's value in including tremendously modern advances in technology in genetics 
into clinical algorithms for disease and drug response. Our paper was titled Race and Genetic Ancestry in Medicine, a Time for Reckoning with Racism. And essentially, companies like 23andMe, which were started in 2006, Ancestry.com, started in the late 1990s, Henry Louis Gates, or Skip Gates, started his Ancestry TV series, all have discussed genetic ancestry. It is March 8th, 2022, 22 years after the completion of the Human Genome Project, and we have yet to incorporate modern genetic advances into clinical medicine, clinical practice, or pharmacogenetic testing. It's time to do so. So as I started off my talk, saying that some people argue that races and ethnicity are purely social constructs, while others argue that it's a biologic construct, many of us in the country, and particularly here at the University of California, San Francisco, believe that it's a complex interaction. Well, I was fine to let it go at that until I got this email. Since I'm a physician at the University of California, San Francisco, on, I got this email from our chief clinical officer at UCSF Health on October 14th of last year by Josh Adler. And uh, full disclosure, Dr. Adler gave me permission to share this uh, with you. And essentially, the email went to all physicians at UCSF saying uh, that we, uh, as physicians who see patients, could not use race, ethnicity in any clinical algorithms that we use because it perpetuates the incorrect belief that race has a biologic basis. So they started off with kidney function, they eliminated the use of race uh, and very well intentioned, but misinformed in my opinion. They didn't ask for my opinion, nor the opinions of people that study race and genetic ancestry at UCSF but they made a carte blanche statement saying that we as physicians couldn't use it and uh, that we needed to move on. Well, un unbeknownst to Dr. Adler, I have been thinking about this all my life. This is my, uh, my grandfather is shown here. Um, he is the second from the right, uh, Esteban Gonzalez. I'm named Esteban Gonzalez. Uh, my grandfather is from Mexico, came to California, worked in the California farms. Um, and I'm very proud to say that all the children that he's raised uh, of the 12 children, all the males served in the US military, including World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. But regardless, my point is that I have thought about race and ethnicity since I was born. When I took this picture, I didn't realize that it was superimposed on the top of my most recent uh, issue of the New England Journal of Medicine. And this is a close-up shot of my, my great-grandparents and my grandfather, Esteban Gonzalez, on the top right. And if you look closely, you can see that my great-grandfather in the middle is very tall. He's got wavy hair. We've always known that we are racially mixed. We are part... African, we are part Native American, we are part European. And if you look at my grandfather on the top right and look at how I looked in college when I was an NCAA wrestler, I look very similar. And this is my mother before she passed away. And you can see that my mother, uh, my beautiful mother is very, very, very dark and I'm light. And I recall fondly when I used to climb in her bed and she used to read to me the Dr. Seuss books specifically the one Dr. Seuss book, Are You My Mother? I always ask that question, are you my mother or who, who am I, right? We are, uh, she has obviously much more pigment than I do. Uh, and uh, yet, uh, this is my mother. <laughs> uh, I love her to death and Molly, I miss you. Uh, I was very fortunate to get a sample of my mother's uh, DNA and submitted to 23andMe before she passed away. And you see my mother's ancestry on the left, my ancestry on the right. You can see that my mother is about 53% Native American, 
38% European and the rest is African. Um, on the right, I'm 28% Native American, I'm 65% European and the rest is African. On the far, far right, you see all the origins of our genetic ancestry. If you look at Mexico, which is has the hash bar over it, that's where we have originated from. Now, we didn't cross the border, the border moved on us. So just so you, to be fair, but you see that uh, the region of China and Northeast China and Siberia, and the Siberian Straits are particularly highlighted because that's where Native Americans originated from. And we have a significant component of Native American ancestry. The karyotype on the bottom right corner is a mosaic of ancestry. And so when you go through all the chromosomes and all the genes, you could say that some genes are Native American in origin, some genes are African in origin, some genes in, are European in origin, and that makes a difference for common diseases like diabetes, breast cancer. We are co-authors to a seminal study on breast cancer and uh, susceptibility in Latinas. The senior author is my my, one of my best colleagues, Elad Ziv, and Elad Ziv demonstrated that if you were, had Native American ancestry at the estrogen receptor, you had a lower likelihood of breast, developing breast cancer than if you're a European. So as I said, I'm a specialist in pulmonary medicine. I'm board certified in uh, internal medicine and board certified in pulmonary medicine. And when I was a young training at the Brigham Women's Hospital at Harvard, I, I saw data that looked like this from the C Center for Disease Control, looking at asthma prevalence by race and ethnicity. And what you see on the left is prevalence, on the right is mortality. And what the CDC demonstrated was that the populations with the highest prevalence and mortality are Puerto Ricans, and the populations with the lowest prevalence and mortality are Mexicans. However, despite that observation, in 1993, Congress passed a law requiring the inclusion of women and minorities in all federally funded clinical and biomedical research. Well, we did, this, we did a scorecard and we published this article that was picked up by the journal Science in 2015, demonstrating that despite the passage of that law, less than 5% of all NIH funded research that's focused on lung disease included minority subjects. So to address that, the social activist in me came out and I'm very grateful that I was trained at Harvard Brigham and Women's where uh, people like Paul Farmer, Jeff Trazen led a whole movement in uh, social activism. And I'm, I'm sorry to inform you if you didn't know already, Paul Farmer passed away recently uh, of a heart attack. But in response to this, I created what's called the UCSF Asthma Collaboratory. We study what we call the majority minority because we, and I'm part of that minority population, are understudied in clinical and biomedical research. We created two large studies, uh, Genetics of Asthma in Latino Americans, the study of asthma uh, African Americans genes environment studies. We assembled a nationwide and international network within North America of clinical recruitment sites that serve minority patients. We started this in 1998. We're still going strong. And it's, as you can tell, I'm in a hotel room in Puerto Rico because we're here at a clinical recruitment site. But we, we built this network to not only capitalize on the diversity with respect to socioeconomic status, environmental differences, but also genetics. And I'm very proud to say that all my colleagues who are listed here, featured here, were seminal in the creation of this. And as of today, March 8th, 2022, we have recruited more than 13,000 minority participants. This is the largest and richest gene environment study of asthma and minority children in the United States. We collected very detailed phenotype information, geocoded data, 
we have DNA, we have RNA, we have epigenetics, we have drug response, we have exposures, environmental exposures, social determinants of health, discrimination, and geocoded measures of air pollution. One of the things that we did is we measured lung function in all the children. And here's a picture of us in, in, at our, one of our field sites. And here you have little Juanito, who happens to be Puerto Rican. He's breathing in and out of a machine. And on the right, you see a quantitative measure of how tight his airways are. The top graph is exhalation and the bottom graph is inspiration. And this is a child with asthma or not asthma. We collected both healthy individuals and individuals who had a diagnosis, a physician diagnosis of asthma. One of the cool things I wanna talk about is a, a project that the Food and Drug Administration, as well as Genentech funded, was to look at the different flavors of asthma. And as a non-physician or as a general physician, you might think that asthma is the same, but as a pulmonary specialist, we know that there are different flavors of asthma. On the right, you have eosinophilic asthma. On the left, you have allergic sense of asthma. And all these different flavors require different or are responsive to different drug therapies based upon, say, in this case, peripheral blood cell counts or eosinophil counts or IgE levels. And what my colleague did, Noah Zeitlin, Elad Ziv, and, and their team of uh, postdocs, is they looked at blood parameters, common blood parameters. This is a very difficult slide to see, but on the left, I have females. Uh, uh, in the top left, I have creatinine levels. On the bottom left, I have white blood cell counts. On the top right, I have hemoglobin A1C levels. And on the bottom right, I have bilirubin. And you can look at the distribution. On the y-axis, I have race, ethnicity. So non-Hispanic whites, others whites, Asians, African-Americans, and Hawaiians. And what they demonstrated in about... 60,000 patients from UCSF Health, 62 million tests that race ethnicity was strongly associated with differences in biomarkers in the blood. This is actually important because uh, according to asthma treatment guidelines, going from the left being more mild to the right being more severe, they refer to the addition of new biologic therapies based on eosinophil counts or total IgE counts. And as I said earlier, there are different flavors of asthma and each flavor has a different response to some of the new therapies. Well, fortunately we've been blessed in the last five years to have all these new biologics come out not only for cancer, other connective tissue disorders, but asthma. There's therapies like Zolair, which is made, or omalizumab made by Genentech for allergic asthma. There's Dupixin or Dupilumab for eosinophilic asthma. Dupilumab used for other allergic disorders like atopic dermatitis. And these are data that we published last summer. And the left is the biologics and for anti-IgE therapy for asthma. And on the right are asthma that's characterized by high eosinophilic levels. And now we're talking about biomarkers in children with moderate to severe asthma. And we, we looked at our clinical data and just simply asked the question, who is eligible based on their biologic or peripheral blood cell biomarker parameters. And at least for allergic asthma, we demonstrated that less than 25% uh, or less than 75% of children are eligible for anti-IgE therapy. But what's more important is on the right, we demonstrated that less than 50% of African-American children with moderate to severe asthma are eligible for 
eosinophilic derived asthma directed therapies. Less than 27% of Puerto Rican children are eligible. Well, we published that last summer. We didn't realize that Regeneron and its parent company published this paper in the New England Journal of Medicine in December of 2021. And this led the FDA to give Regeneron FDA approval for their new drug Dupilumab for moderate to severe asthma in children. This is a study led by investigators that were part of the Liberty Asthma Voyage investigators. As I mentioned, it was published in the New England Journal. If you meet, read the middle uh, panel, it's a great design study. It's a phase three multinational multicenter randomized double-blind trial comparing dupilumab treatment to placebo in children age six to 11 with moderate to severe asthma. The study was done in three continents. <laughs> but on the right, you see who was included in the study. 90% were populations of European origin. So despite the fact that this study was done in three continents, they missed the mark. So the editors of the New England Journal asked us for commentary and we also submitted this accompanying commentary uh, regarding their study. And here's the scorecard. On the left, you have the original Dupilumab study who was included on the right, in the middle panel, you have real world data on the prevalence of asthma by race ethnicity in the United States. And on the far right, you see our data that was published in the summer, where we demonstrate that based on blood parameters, African American children with moderate to severe asthma do not qualify based on differential blood cell counts because blood cell counts vary by race. Despite that, the companies went ahead and published these ads. They blitzed the market during the Super Bowl, the, all the games leading up to it with these ads. Dupilumab prevents asthma attacks. Who do they feature? African-Americans. It's, it's what I would consider, and I'm not a marketer, I'm a physician scientist, deceptive marketing. The studies were done in whites, yet all the commercials show Blacks and Latinos or African-Americans and Latinos. The big takeaway that I want you to get is that although biologic therapies represent a new dawn in medical care, the benefits have not risen to reach all patients. It's critical that current and future therapeutics be studied in patients of diverse racial, ethnic, socioeconomic backgrounds to bring maximal benefits to all of us. This is a wake up call that current and future asthma therapeutics must be studied in populations of diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds. I'm an asthma, I'm a pulmonary specialist. I'm only gonna comment on that, but you could say the same is true for other diseases like cancer, rheumatologic diseases. One of my favorite topics is this slide. And as I mentioned, we created a tremendous resource of minority children from all over the United States, Puerto Rico, and Mexico. And as I said, I'm in a hotel room at our Puerto Rican site, clinical recruitment site. One of my colleagues, my best, smartest physician scientist, asked, can we leverage genetic ancestry to scientific advantage? My mentor at the time always encouraged me, Jeff Drazen, former editor of New England Journal, my mentor at, at the Brigham Women's Hospital uh, in 1997 and 98, said, who cares? Is it clinically relevant? Recall that we measured spirometry in all these kids. Well, when you have any clinical test done, if you're Joe Blow, you need to be compared to a population average. For lung disease, we only have three population averages. We have one for whites, or what, what the NHANES called it, Caucasian at the time, is the incorrect term. We have a, a population value for African-Americans. We have a population value for Mexicans. On the left, I have males. On the right, I have females. 
on the y-axis, I have lung volume. So the higher you are, the larger your lungs, the lower you are, the smaller your lungs. And on the, on the x-axis, I have increase in age. So number one, you can see that going from five to 85, Ann Haynes uh, published that life goes downhill at 25. We all know that. And this is pretty profound because when I was seeing patients at UCSF in the pulmonary function lab, I had a patient that came in just like this. We all know President Obama's story. He's half African, half European. And so when I'm, I had a firefighter who was, looked just like President Obama, and I had to compare the firefighter's lung function to a population average. And so when I was following the technician around, I watched the technician use a pull down. Is he white, is he black, or is he Mexican? And the technician pulled down black and I turned to the patient and since I'm from the hood, I could code switch and I turned to my patient and I said, hey man, are you a brother or are you white? And he goes, no, I'm half. And that was an aha moment for me. That was in 1999 at UCSF. And I had already been studying genetic ancestry long before 23andMe came around, right around the time Ancestry.com came around. And, I, and we measure genetic ancestry in our population of African-American individuals, all of whom said all four grandparents are African-American. And what we, we did is we just ranked a subsample of 275 patients shown here, each line, each vertical line represents an individual. The color, uh, whether it's orange or green, and I apologize if someone's colorblind, orange represents African ancestry, green represents European ancestry, but you can see there's tremendous variation, what we call intraracial variation in genetic ancestry. So when we go back to lung function, we ask the question, should we use self-identified race ethnicity or I assigned race ethnicity versus genetic ancestry? And these are my colleagues, my uh, former postdoc, Melinda Aldrich on the top left. She's now a faculty at Vanderbilt. My former graduate student, Max Seibold, who's now a faculty at National Jewish. Raj Kumar, who was a fellow at the time, who's faculty at Northwestern. And one of my co-interns and residents and longtime collaborators, Kiyoki Williams, who's a faculty at Henry Ford. And what we demonstrated was really cool. In seven independent cohorts of African-Americans, healthy and those that had asthma, who had measures of lung function, we demonstrated, we were the first in the world to demonstrate that genetic ancestry quantitative measures of genetic ancestry were correlated with quantitative measures of lung function. The more African ancestry you had, the lower your lung function. And this is important because uh, on the y-axis, we have lung volume. So the higher you are, the, the larger your lungs, the lower you are, the shorter or the smaller your lungs. On the x-axis axis going from left to right, we have increase in amounts of African ancestry. If I measured the lung function of my African-American firefighter patient, I'd have to compare him to a population average to see where he stands. Do I use the African reference equation? Do I use the Caucasian reference equation? And we demonstrated that depending upon someone's ancestry, if they are under 78% African ancestry, we would underestimate their lung function. If they were over 78% African ancestry, we would overestimate the lung function. We demonstrated that there's much as a 15% error in the measurement of lung function, depending upon one's ancestry. Well, this is done in African-American populations and we published this in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2010. We followed up on this and did the same analysis in a population of Mexicans from the United States and Mexicans from Mexico and repeated the analysis and repeated the results demonstrating that depending upon the type of Native American ancestry the individual had, it influenced where you stood on the lung function measures. 
So the big question is, and many have argued, what about social and environmental factors? Well, one of my best postdocs in my entire career, Maria Pino Giannis, on the top left, paired up with Neetha Talker, who is a pulmonary and critical care fellow with me in my lab. And we asked, since we had the data, we asked the question, what's, what's more important? Is it ancestry and lung function? And we measured this in 5,500 minority children, or is it environmental exposures, secondhand smoke, air pollution, or is it socioeconomic factors? Does education, discrimination, acculturation, does that influence it? And we asked out of the three of these, ancestry, environment, socioeconomic factors, which one's the stronger, biggest, bigger predictor of lung function? And what the two, uh, Maria and Nita demonstrated is that genetic ancestry, even after adjusting for environmental exposures to air pollution, socioeconomic or social determinants of health, ancestry was the biggest driver. Pretty impressive. And this is a repeat uh, earlier graph. Maria and, and Nita Taka were able to demonstrate that with increasing amounts of African ancestry amongst Latinos, that African ancestry was the biggest driver and was larger, had a larger impact than social determinants of health and environmental determinants of health. So what does this really mean? Why should you care? Well, when we have disease misclassification, it's a big deal. It leads to inappropriate referrals, inappropriate tests, inappropriate treatments. It has implications for disability, lung transplant referrals, preoperative risk, workers' compensation, like my firefighter, patient who had occupational exposure to air or fire and smoke uh, and reimbursement for pulmonary rehabilitation. Now, I, I know it's difficult to see, but think about it. Penicillin was discovered in 1928. The Human Genome Project was completed in 2000, 22 years ago. Don't you think it's time to incorporate modern advances in genetic studies into clinical practice? Unfortunately, the majority of publications out there, especially given the recent events in 2020 at George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Trayvon Warren, many more, the majority of publications have been commentaries or viewpoints. 90% on this topic, less than 10% have been empiric evidence-based studies. Out of that 10%, we have probably contributed the most. So the big thing that I like you to take away is that race, genetic ancestry and medicine are intertwined. Key point, if you take any way, anything away today, the epidemiologic importance of race ethnicity will never disappear. Throwing away race ethnicity without careful clinical consideration is not the answer and may lead to more inequalities. This is the direct opposite of what our chief medical officer at UCSF asked us to do. Rather than opinions, and bowing down to social pressure. We need empiric evidence, not more opinions. I wanna thank my team. Uh, one of my biggest mentors and supporters, Neil Rich. My partner, Elad, Luisa Varel, who's at City University of New York. Uh, Jennifer Laraway, um, Noah Zeitlin, and my entire lab team shown there. Also want to thank um, our funders. The early data that I demonstrated in, uh, was funded in part by the NIH, NHLBI in particular, NIEHS. The study on biologics was funded by Genentech and the FDA. I want to thank all my collaborators 
And um, I'm going to end it here and uh, take questions. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you for a fabulous talk. You have a wonderful way of blending personal stories and just stories about people into great science. So you've got a lot of questions, as you can imagine, in the Q&A. So I'm going to read you some questions and uh, if you could answer. So here's one from Matt, Natalie Monegro. What has the Asthma Collaboratory done to build recruitment efforts in minority populations? What would you recommend to others doing the same thing in other indications or therapeutic areas? Well, thank you, uh, Natalie. Uh, we only recruit minorities. Um, we have created the largest clinical network of minority serving providers that see children with, with and without asthma. Uh, we uh, have amassed over 13,000 minority participants. We have gotten, received funding for whole genome sequencing on, on 15,986 minority children. We received funding for RNA-seq on about 3,500. We've shared all that data with the NHLBI, and it's all publicly available. We've contributed over 33% of the whole genome sequencing data to the NHLBI's top med program. That's what we've done. Okay, thank you, Stubborn. Here's another question from Margaret Van Heusen. Isn't race a poor surrogate for genetics? What is the basis to include warnings on medication labels if there is no mechanistic or genetic support for why a certain race would be performing more poorly, for example, decreased efficacy? So she's asking whether race is a poor surrogate for genetics. Yes, exactly, I agree with you. But it's the best surrogate we have at the moment. Race and ethnicity, are not the same as genetic ancestry. I would encourage you to please read our January 6, 2021 New England Journal piece, where we clearly articulate the differences and the overlap between the two. There are clear drugs, carbamazepine being one of them, alcohol being one of them, that have differential effects. Look at the red flushing from alcohol in Asians. Alcohol is a drug, just like any other drug, like carbamazepine. Plavix, the best drug we got out there, the most recent drug for heart attacks and strokes, doesn't work. 50% of Asians, 76% of Pacific Islanders, including Filipinos. My kids are Filipina. So we clearly know a mechanism. Healthcare systems don't want to do the genetic ancestry testing or the genetic testing to prove whether or not you will be responsive to Plavix or not. So we got to get with the program and we've got to start incorporating modern genetic technologies into clinical practice. But Seven, let me follow up on that question. But until that point, FDA does have certain products that they might label according to dose in Asians or dose in a certain population. For you, that seems like an okay interim solution? Or? There are over 100 drugs that have black box warnings based on race. And that was when I was teaching genetics and pharmacogenetics 2015, I think, at UCSF. There are probably more. What I'm calling for is the inclusion of genetic ancestry into clinical algorithms and drug response. Okay. I don't think we'll ever get away from including race ethnicity because it's, it's, it's such a good epidemiologic tool and proxy for so many other things. Um, I don't need to tell you in Ferguson, Missouri, what's the likelihood of a person dying from a police officer? All you need to know is that they're male, black, or white. That has nothing to do with biology but it's a good proxy. All right, Stella, next question from Kevin Lorick. 
Is it possible to identify multiple genes that could be more important in the long run than genetic origin in determining response to therapy? Well, genetic variants vary by populations. That's what's fascinated me. And in, when I was at the Brigham, we identified a gene that was associated with asthma severity and it is 40% more prevalent in African-Americans than it was in whites. And that, I fell in love with what I'm doing now. And 22 plus three, that's 25 years later, I'm still married and in love with that project. That's great, Stevan. Okay, a question from, whoops, it just moved down my side. Okay, this is from Sarah W. For the ancestry, and lung function study by Kumar et al. Have there been follow-up studies to test whether this is replicated in African countries? To my knowledge, no. It has been, so as I mentioned, we published the journal Science. Uh, so our New England Journal paper was Kumar et al. Uh, he was my trainee. It took a large team to do that work. We, that was African-Americans. We followed up with a study in Mexican populations in science. And then we followed up in Latino and African-American pa uh, patients or individuals in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. Others have replicated our results by nutritional status in Indian populations or South Asian populations. Okay, thank you. How do you, somebody, this is Wesley B. How do you define race? It varies by country. It's a great question. Uh, right now we're using census definitions for the United States. Okay. Mark Gummel, is patient reported race and ethnicity an adequate surrogate for genetic markers of racial origin? Race and ethnicity are not the same as genetic ancestry, but it's the best we have right now. Okay. This is Lauren Caroline Tudros Potter. I was wondering what your thoughts are on the recent guidance released by the FDA about diversifying clinical trials. Do you think the language from the guidance is strong enough or will make an impact? So if you've read it, Stella. Well, I have to be honest. Um, I, I have not recently read the guidelines, so I don't know it off the top of my head, but I'm the one that has published the most on the need to include racially diverse populations. When I was in training, we did all these cardiovascular studies in old white men, and we took the results and generalized it to women. It wasn't until women were at the table at the design stage, got involved, led the Women's Health Initiative, that we started including women. And what happened? Lo and behold, we found out that women present differently for heart attacks. It's like a no, duh. And then they also present different response to drugs. That's why Ambien had to be reformulated for women. <laughs> That's like, I know it's 2022 and we think, how could you have thought that women are different, are, are not different than men? They are different. Amen. So, okay, this is from Victoria Kack. No question, but since the chat is disabled, I very much wanted to thank you, Dr. Burchard, for your powerful work and speaking here at the FDA today. Okay, thank next you. one from Nargis Weir. What is the correct designation for the African-American firefighter right now? How do we minimize incorrect labeling today with PFTs? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I'm a member of the American Thoracic Society, and because of the recent events of 2020, everybody is calling for the exclusion of race ethnicity from clinical algorithms. All I'm saying is the Human Genome Project was completed 22 years ago. We can do genetic ancestry. <laughs> Henry Louis Gates talks about it on his TV show, 23andMe's doing it. Ancestry.com's doing it. We got to get up to speed with the times. 
we should do the empiric work looking at what's better, race, ethnicity, genetic ancestry, or the combination. That's all I'm asking for. Empiric data, not opinions. Great, Esteban. This one is from Jennifer Lawrence. Great presentation. Do you advocate incorporation of genetic ancestry testing into clinical trials instead of grouping subjects by race, ethnicity designation? How would that impact expense of clinical trials? Um, yes. Uh, like I said a minute ago, and I, I apologize, I, I'm at a clinical recruitment site. There are dogs outside my hotel, and that's what you hear in the background. Uh, I don't need it. As I said, we don't need more opinions. We need empiric evidence-based data. We don't know the answer. Is race ethnicity a better predictor of clinical out outcomes, lung function, kidney function, mammographic density, or genetic ancestry, or the combination of the two? Please, please read our New England Journal editorial from January 6, 2021. It's an easy day to remember it's the day of the insurrection. Stevan, here's one I love because uh, it applies to both of us. What is your opinion on documenting more granular racial data for mixed race in clinical trials and electronic health record, which are often used for real world evidence studies? Often medical and clinical trials do not include the composition of mixed race. For instance, mixed race with African-American and Puerto Rican would be at much higher risk of asthma than mixed race involving non-Hispanic white and Asian. Uh, whoever had that comment is right on. <laughs> I'm, I'm in Puerto Rico. Um, the average Puerto Rican, you know, if you just pluck someone out of the population is 25% African, 16% Native American, and the rest is European. But if you go all around the island, there are some places that are 100% African and some places 100% European. Myself, I'm 28% Native American, about 8% African and the rest is European. So where do I fit? And in fact, <laughs> I had my kidney function done and gee, my, the head of nephrology at UCSF couldn't figure out who to compare me to. <laughs> okay, here's from Margaret Bash. Can you give us an idea of how racial identification compared with genetics in your minority pediatric population? Well, I, I showed a graph. So for our study, we required individuals to self-identify their parents, to self-identify themselves, all four grandparents as being 100% African-American, 100% Mexican, or 100% Puerto Rican. Despite our best effort to be epidemiologically, quote unquote, correct, we got huge variation. We got individuals for the African-American study, we had individuals at 10% African, 90% European, individuals that were like President Obama, 50-50, individuals that are 90% African, 10% European. So I think that makes a big clinical difference. From a sociologic point of view, when a police officer looks at an individual like President Obama, like our respiratory technician said, they consider them black and they automatically get binned and treated differently than non-blacks. And the evidence bears that out. I'm sorry if I'm passionate about it. I was severely impacted uh, by the events of 2020 as you, many of you I know were. Racism and anti-Semitism are alive and well. Jim Crow did not go away. Jim Crow just went underground and has been incorporated into our institutions. Okay, this one, thank you, uh, Stabon. This one's from Jacqueline Kunkelman. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge in reference to your comment that we need to do more to evaluate therapeutics based upon genetic ancestry. Many people are reluctant to provide genetic information or learn more about their own genetic backgrounds due to concerns about discrimination. How do we overcome this reluctance and provide reasonable assurance that this information will not be used to limit access to treatment or by insurance companies to deny coverage? So I can only defend the United States. Other countries do what they do. 
But in the United States, we have the GINA law, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, that prevents companies, and I'm with you. Uh, when I signed up for life insurance, when I signed up for health insurance, I did not want my genetic information to be shared. However, it is becoming popular. It is what we call recreational science, 23andMe, Ancestry.com. Henry Louis Gates or Skip Gates has his little show. Oprah's done a huge story on this. I think it's time for us to move on. It's 2022. Let's start doing the hard work and doing the empiric studies to ask that question. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm taking hardly any more questions. I'll take these three, but we'll have a hard stop at uh, California time anyway, 1 p.m. But Kin Lee, do you have any thoughts on what percentage of minority population should be included in clinical study? Should it consider the disease prevalence by minority groups, race, gender, et cetera, as a guidance? How about who pays the bill? So as of today, as of today, March 8, 2022, over 50% of children are not white. As of today, African-Americans and Latinos combined make up 37% of the US population. Asians make up a pretty significant proportion too. Combined, we're a big source of that tax generated revenue that funds publicly supported institutions like the National Institute of Health, CDC, FDA. We tried and failed to cover up racial differences with COVID. I am so proud of the CDC for making sure that that data was included because we clearly demonstrated racial differences to susceptibility to COVID. Okay. Margaret Van Heusen, as the use of algorithms in medicine increases, do you have any recommendation for incorporation of racial data that would help avoid the racial biases that are built into the historical data? Uh, great question. And I agree with you 100%. I think as I said multiple times, we have to do empiric studies, evidence-based studies, not opinions. Okay, thank you, Esteban. I am going to conclude uh, this great, uh, very interactive presentation. Thank you so much for giving us a fabulous presentation in Puerto Rico. Thank you, Esteban, and thank all of you for attending. Thank you.